In the Institute for Art and Ideas presentations we looked at last time, all of the contributors that we looked at were physicists. But there were scientists from other disciplines who also made interesting contributions. Donald Hoffman is a professor of cognitive science at the University of California, Irvine. In his quest to find the origin of consciousness, he examined quantum mechanics and particle physics to see if they have any clues. So by material, I think of objects in space and time. And physicists such as David Gross and Nima Arkani Hamed are now telling us that space-time is doomed. By that, they mean space-time is not fundamental. And they're not just throwing up their hands and giving up. Uh, the physicists have now found structures beyond space-time, like the positive Grassmannian, the amplitude hedron. And so this, this is all new. It's only been in the last 10 years that they've, for example, had the amplitude hedron. But the idea that space and time and objects like um, bosons, leptons, and quarks, particles and so forth, are fundamental is now no longer the received opinion. Um, there's something deeper, like the amplitudehedron, and beyond that, something called uh, decorated permutations. And so, so the idea of reductionism is also doomed, according to physicists like Neem Arkani Hamed, the idea that as we go to smaller and smaller scales in space and time, we find more and more fundamental laws and more and more fundamental entities that's also dead. So, so I'm not a panpsychist in the sense that I don't want to try to put consciousness in, in the elementary particles because the, the physicists themselves tell us that space-time and the so-called elementary particles are doomed. We have to go entirely outside of space-time and, and trying to put consciousness inside of particles or behind particles. We have, we have to have a much deeper framework. I find it very interesting that his confidence in the work of two high-profile physicists is sufficient to convince him of the complete downfall of science accepted for decades, the so-called standard model. He's confident that the positive Grassmannian and the amplitude hedron have already wiped it out. What does that say for trust in the scientific consensus? It seems he lost faith in physics to give him clues into the origin of consciousness. So he turned to evolution instead. Now, evolution by natural selection also agrees. This is work that I've done with some of my colleagues. It also agrees that um, our, our perceptions of space and time are not an insight into the nature of reality. They're, they're merely an, a, a, an interface, an artifact of our, of our um, perceptual sensory systems. There's a technical question. What is the probability that evolution would shape sensory systems to see any aspect of the structure of reality as it is? And it turns out the probability is precisely zero that any sensory system has ever been shaped to see any aspect of the structure of objective reality. So evolution and the physicists agree. Space-time is doomed and, and reductionism is doomed. And so we have to look for a theory of consciousness outside of it. And, and I would agree with, with Sam that uh, solipsism is not the answer either. We, we needed a theory of consciousness that's not solipsistic. Two things strike me about this. First, he seems to be telling us that the probability of consciousness being achieved by evolution and natural selection is zero. That fits very well with the probabilities we saw in earlier episodes for biopolymers, and everything else to do with life evolving by natural selection. But then he seems to say, the problem is that our senses don't tell us the truth about the real world. Well, it's true, they don't tell us about the world he seems to think we live in, a mathematical world of Grassmannians and amplitude hedrons, a world which has just pushed out another world, that mathematicians used to believe in. And that brings us to the second thing that strikes me, his rejection of solipsism as a solution. That idea, I alone exist and everything else is a construct of my imagination, has become an accepted cop-out for almost anything. And it's claimed that it can't be disproved. I suppose the problem with that is, I might imagine that the real world is the world that the God of the Bible created, and it doesn't consist of 
amplitudehedrons and decorated permutations, and he probably wouldn't think that's a good idea. Another contributor was Peter White, a mathematician from Columbia University. He had some things to say about maths and its relationship to modern physics. I think I sometimes say that I take kind of a, a radical Platonistic attitude that not only does math exist, but it really actually is the same thing as fundamental, at a fundamental level as physics. And, and some of the reasons for saying that are actually just the experience, especially in recent years, if you look at the history of mathematics, where these ideas for, about mathematical structures come from, they often come from two sources, from, from physics and the physical world, and then from number theory. But in recent years, there have been ways in which you can see these things coming together. And some of the most exciting research is happening now in mathematics, the frontiers of mathematics, involves ideas which, you know, where there's a clear component of this. I mean, just to give a name to it, there's this idea of the geometric Langlands program. And you can, that is something that kind of came out of number theory, and it, but it brought connections to physics and to geometry. And it's, when you're looking at the deepest level, just these connections between what you thought was purely mathematical objects and what you thought was, was physics just are just have striking relations and are, we're learning striking things about that. As he told us, this striking new tie-up between maths and physics is called the Geometrical Langlands Program. Robert Langlands was an outstanding Canadian mathematician, famous for developing a mathematical connection between number theory and harmonics. Other mathematicians hijacked Langlands' idea and applied it to geometry and called it the Geometrical Langlands Program. Langlands did not approve. He thought it was nonsense and wanted his name to be taken out of it. But people like White see this as a wonderful opportunity to bring in a new kind of math so they can construct new creation tales and new quantum tales and new particle tales. Another of the invited speakers was Bjorn Eckeberg, a very well-known philosopher of science who pointed out what I see as the real source of the mess that science is now in. It's not my role to judge the merit of a scientific theory. That is for the scientific community. That is one consequence of uh, physics and philosophy sort of breaking, breaking apart. So right now we have uh, cosmologists or scientists, more generally speaking, are setting all the terms for how to approach and understand the universe. And they're also the ones who judge whether they think a theory has more merit or not. The original scientists like Newton and Dalton called themselves natural philosophers. The title scientist was only invented in the 19th century. Philosophy used to be an essential ingredient in the scientific process. But in 1920, Einstein declared that science had no need of philosophy. We've seen how that led to physics becoming a branch of science which completely discarded common sense, an essential component of philosophy. It subjected itself instead to abstract mathematics devoid of connection to the real world. And that's why White can see mathematics and physics as one and the same thing. Uh, to some degree, the core of the model is taken as a matter of faith. And that if you are to question it, then you risk running afoul uh, of a lot of things regarding you know, funding and career and, and so on. You can build a career now on challenging some of the upper blocks, so to speak. For example, dark matter. There is a real challenger to this particular uh, part. But uh, I find very few scientists are willing to look at the more questionable assumptions underneath the core building blocks of how we got here in the first place. And the reason why it strikes me is not uh, because those blocks are so solid and proven beyond doubt when you look at them closely. It's more that if you are to put them into doubt or if they are slightly wrong or if you are to remove them, then you lose the guiding structure you have to make sense of the universe. It's like taking a framework away from a scientist is 
the same as making them blind. Like, then we have nothing to guide us by. Eckerberg points out that physicists are allowed to criticize peripheral aspects of the standard model. But if you try to criticize the Big Bang's core concepts, you're likely to get no funding and you're likely to be rejected. It's rather surprising that Eric Lerner, who we listened to last time, has been able to survive while challenging key aspects of the standard theory. You can't simply say, well, we want a pure Big Bang without inflation, without dark energy, without dark matter, because the theory collapses. These were introduced to prevent, to overcome severe conflicts with observation. If you don't have inflation, then the theory predicts a microwave background that would be completely crazy quilt. It wouldn't be at all even. If you don't have dark energy, you have a problem that the universe is older, is, is younger than the uh, Milky Way galaxy. If you don't have dark matter, the universe can't form any uh, you know, clusters or galaxies at all. It doesn't form structure. So you can't simply say, well, we want the pure one without all this fairy dust. In contrast, what we are talking about is an alternative that relies on verified laboratory uh, evidence. And conversely, theories that are developed for uh, astrophysics can be applied here on Earth. And I want to again come back to our own work as an example. Forty years ago, I developed a model of quasars based on phenomena that observed in a device called the dense plasma focus, which spontaneously forms without gravitation, extremely dense plasmoids, very energy concentrated uh, blobs of plasma that emit beams of energy, just like a quasar. I developed this model quantitatively, applied it to quasar data, and then used it to design a version of our device. So we might ask, how Lerner has managed to survive, even though challenging some aspects of the core of the Big Bang. Well, he gets all of his funding privately, from interested businessmen and crowdfunding, and he has the acumen and charisma to organize this funding himself. It's one of the legacies of the split between philosophy and science in the 20th century is uh, it's a strand of thought sometimes called logical empiricism or positivism, which really greatly influenced science into this uh, rise of the professional school of, uh, of science, is to believe that science uh, has to be free of metaphysics and that it's the ideal is to have a science that's uh, pure without having to make any such grounding claims or any such framing devices. So in my view, this is a delusion. Uh, and it would be much better if we could speak openly about what the guiding assumptions or the premises for a theory are and speak about them openly instead of trying to hide them away. If you look at scientific texts or any scientific calculation, if you look at Einstein's own work on general relativity, he has a couple of pages describing the assumptions or the principles that he uses. And then there's pages of mathematical equations. Now, most physicists would be trained to look at his math and then to train to look at the, the field equations uh, and to kind of gloss over the assumptions part. But all of those assumptions are themselves uh, up for debate or questionable. They're ways of framing the problem. And I don't think you can ever get around that. And here, I think Bjorn Eckerberg gets to the crux of the matter. Science has always had to face metaphysics. The obvious fact that there must be something beyond the physical world we can see. And physicists in particular have taken pains to deaden the scientific consciousness to the necessity of addressing assumptions of their theories. I went to a conference some years ago. One of the delegates was pointed out to me as being Russian. He was standing all alone looking a bit lost, so I went and greeted him in Russian. He was surprised and delighted, and we chatted for a while. 
He invited me to read the paper he was going to present. We met again later, and he asked me what I thought of his paper. I told him I wondered about the justification for some of the assumptions. He looked puzzled and said, Is there a mistake in the mathematics? No, I said, I found no mistake in the mathematics. I only wondered about some of the assumptions. With obvious annoyance, he said, If there's no mistake in the mathematics, how can there be anything wrong with the paper? Then he turned on his heel and walked away. It amazes me that super-intelligent scientists can understand complex mathematics and not realize that it all stands on assumptions. Thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.